wasn't almost worth it, but it was all right. <laughs> Just to let you know we're beginning. It is uh, really good to see all of you here this morning. And, uh, and uh, I thought spring and summer was getting here. I've said this 20 times now. I think this is the last weekend we're going to have a little chilly weather. Probably be 50 next week. Who knows? Um, we begin a new series today. A uh, new series called Breath. And for the next three weeks, we're going to sort of sandwich. Pentecost Sunday is next Sunday. And so we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit over the next today and obviously next Sunday on Pentecost Sunday and then the Sunday after. And uh, I, but I, this series, Breath, is a great title because we know this, that's one of the words for the Holy Spirit. The word for breath in the Bible is, very, is similar to the Spirit. And I was thinking about this idea of breath, and I can remember, obviously, I, I could tell, I thought, I'm not going to tell a COVID story, although breath is pretty relevant right now. Breath is something that's very, we've seen how valuable it can be, or the loss of it not be. But I remember one time, Andy and I were living in North Carolina, and we took an anniversary trip out to Colorado Springs. And uh, Andy always likes to go warm places, but our anniversary is in April. So it's a roll of the dice, really, if you get somewhere, you know. So if you go somewhere, you know, that you expect it to be warm and it's not, it kind of shoots the whole deal. And so we decided, let's go to, let's go to the base of Pikes Peak. And then if it's warm, hey, it's great. If it's not, who thought it was going to be warm in Colorado in, in April? And, and we have some friends out there. And so we took this trip out there. And back then, I was doing a lot of, uh, not, not the, the, the struggle to actually just walk that I do now, but I was running, you know, several miles every day, mostly on a treadmill and sometimes outside. And uh, the, the place we were staying, it was this historic little place in Manitou Springs at the base of Pikes Peak. And all these, everybody from Teddy Roosevelt to Thomas Edison to that, I mean, they had, the, the, the client list of this place was amazing. The springs at one time were thought to be medicinal. And so it was this place that back in the day, these dignitaries would go just to sit in, in, hot, in a hot spring and hopefully it was doing something. I don't know if it did some form or not. But, but each room in, in this sort of small, it was a small little place. And, and I could only afford like two nights there and then we went somewhere cheap for the next night because this, it, it was sort of a fancy place. And not a bed and breakfast, but sort of that vibe a little bit. Each room, I can't remember where we, I think we stayed in the Thomas Edison room. I can't remember, but each room was sort of themed around one of the famous people that had stayed there. But they had a gym. I was like, well, who knew this famous sort of old place they had put a gym in. So I was all excited. I got up the first morning, went, and I was doing my workout. And I got to tell you, boy, that was one of the hardest. I, I was doing my miles I normally do. And I thought, well, how am I, I'm not sure how much. I, I know I ran just a couple days. I skipped a day because we flew out of here. But man, I'm just, what in the world? I can't, you know. And it wasn't until I was trying to explain to Andy later, like, I just, man, I didn't feel like I could barely get through my normal walk. And she said, well, we are a mile high. I was like, oh, <laughs> that altitude thing's a real deal. And I realized in that moment how much I needed oxygen. <laughs> and I needed breath, and I didn't have the same level of breath that I had on the East Coast in Eastern North Carolina. It was a little different. And, uh, and I remember going through the rest of that day. Of course, it was one of those days where um, we started headed to where we, we knew, we knew because uh, what, what else do you do when you're at the base of Pikes Peak but drive 20 minutes north to an outlet mall? Um, I know my wife, and so that made sense in that situation. And so as we're making the drive north towards Monument, uh, up towards Denver, actually, uh, that direction, and it was snow flurries. It was snowing. I was like, what in the world? We went in a couple of stores. When we came out at noon, the snow was gone, and the sun was out, and it was 72 degrees. And I understood then why people from Colorado will wear a hoodie and flip-flops. <laughs> because you just got to be ready for whatever, you know, is going to happen. But, but throughout that day, it took me a while to get my air back, to get the oxygen back I needed. Listen, there's a reason that the Holy Spirit, that breath is a, a function and form of the Holy Spirit. It, we need him like that much. And we're going we're gonna to get back to this point in a second, but I want to start today. Today, I want to just kind of give a broad overview. Today... It, the, the title, I don't know if I can make the title work or not. The, the title is X Factor because the Holy Spirit is that X Factor. He's that thing that, that, that sometimes we think we don't need, but he enables us so greatly. I want to just talk three, three things, and, I, and, and I'm already starting a, a little late this morning, so I, I want to be conscious of that. 
But I only have I only have three points. Nathan would tell you that means we're, we're in for about an hour and a half. But I don't think that's going to be the way it is today. Three points. And I want to just talk about three things that the Holy Spirit provides. And a big general overview. Next week, Victor is going to do a little, we'll zoom in a little more on what the Holy Spirit does for us. And I'll, I'll talk in the week three a little more about that. But today I want to talk about three. Here's the first thing. Write this down. The Holy Spirit provides friction. Friction. That word has kind of a negative context, I guess, unless you're trying to start a fire with a stick. I mean, you know, I, I, you know, there's some occasions, I guess, friction could be positive. I want to, we, we, we hear about the Holy Spirit right in the beginning. So let's go right to Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, let me just kind of give you a, a hint as to how this whole creation story is laid out. There's this declarative statement. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then the writer, Moses, begins to tell us how. He begins to explain how it all started. Some people get caught up in the fact that it says he created the heavens and the earth, and then the earth was formed, and then, well, Jesus, God wouldn't create something dark. And well, he wouldn't, he didn't. This is the story of how it came to be. So here's verse two. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God, here's the Holy Spirit right off the bat, was hovering over the surface of the waters. Now, we know the Holy Spirit, as we read all of Scripture, one of the pictures and types, uh, even to the point of Jesus' baptism, it says the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove. That a dove was sort of a picture and type of the Holy Spirit. Here, it's no different. Doves, this is the way doves would sit over their nest and their eggs to bring the eggs to, to, to hatch. They would, they would not just squat down on top of the eggs, but doves just would sit and hover just over the eggs ever so slightly, creating just enough friction, creating that warmth to have actually hatch eggs. That's what they would do. So it's no surprise to me that the Holy Spirit, who is sort of known in picture and type as a dove, uh, is described in this way. But can I say it this way? The Holy Spirit's job at creation was to create the atmosphere needed for God to speak. The Bible says he hovered over the waters of the deep. And the next thing it says is, and then God said, let there be light. And I would stand and say to you today, I believe that God works in unity with himself in three persons. God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We know they were all there of creation. And in this instance, though, I think it's important that the Holy Spirit was there to create the atmosphere needed, to create that there so that God could speak into darkness and bring light. Can I tell you something though? He's still doing that today. He still does that today. His job today. Is to come. And be part of the creative process. That God wants to do today. It's that friction we feel. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. When the conviction of the Holy Spirit. John 16 8 talks about that. It says when he comes. Talking about the Holy Spirit. He will convict the world of its sin of God's righteousness of the coming judgment. One of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to bring about conviction. Can I tell you, before God can create something new out of the chaos of your life, out of the darkness that you might be walking in, the Holy Spirit comes and brings about that friction. Uh, I almost put this as the, the little statement here, but it sounds kind of silly because it rhymes, but it's the friction of conviction. It's the friction that he brings in your life that makes you stop and go, wait a minute, should I do that or not? Maybe this is not a good idea. And in those moments when you pause and listen to the Holy Spirit, pay attention to the friction in your life, that's when God can speak. That's when God can speak clearly and create something out of a chaotic part of your life. Before God can create something out of the chaos, we need the atmosphere of the convicting Holy Spirit. And we refer to that sometimes as conscience. My conscience was dealing with me. Can I tell you, it's simply the Holy Spirit hovering over the dark areas of your life, revealing them to you, bringing about a friction that you can pay attention to so that God can look into that and say, let there be light. Let there be light. Let something creative happen in this moment. The Holy Spirit provides friction. Here's the second thing. And it took me a long time to come up with this alliteration. He provides friction and he also provides filling. Filling. Look, be patient with me because I, I, I want to get here. This is something I, I heard this week and I, I think it really can help us to understand how this works a little bit. 
So in the field of quantum mechanics, which is the study of physics like on a subatomic level, that, that field tells us that atoms, so our body is made up of molecules that are made up of atoms. Atoms is the, an atom is the smallest possible part of matter there is, okay? So your body is made up of atoms. Not A-D-A-M, atom, atom, we were from that, but A-T-O-M, atoms. And atoms are 99.99% empty space. Uh, the size of an atom is dictated so you know how its size is dictated by how far the electrons orbit around the nucleus. So protons are in the nucleus and then add, uh, electrons orbit and the further out they are is the larger the size of the atom. It's called its outer orbit or its electron shell or atomic shell. And on average, the outside shell of an atom from the nucleus is 100,000 times the size of the nucleus. That's where it gets its mass. Let me give you some perspective. Uh, a couple weeks ago, so you know, I, I drove down, picked up Pastor Dave, we went to see the Atlanta Braves. Oh, I hope he's watching this. He's probably not on call time. You gotta watch my live stream today. We watched the Atlanta Braves beat the Cubs two nights in a row. It was glorious. It was great. The first night I got to sit next to Pastor Dave with two other pastors who were Braves fans. That was really fun because the Braves went up like four nothing in the first inning, and Dave was sitting between me and them. So I kept turning and looking at the Braves fan pastors, past Pastor Dave, and saying, "What inning? Are we still in the first inning? Are we still? Is this still the first inning?" And he just sat there like this, not even paying attention to me, not looking at me, just staring, just looking straight ahead. And then the Cubs came and tied it up and went back and forth. That game was actually close. The next night, not so much close. And, and we were leaving after the game and driving all the way back to his in-laws four hours. So I, I told him, look, if it's a blowout either direction, you mind leaving him? Because neither one of us are leave early kind of people when it comes to a, a game. And he said, you know what? We got a lot. We got four hours to drive. It's late at night. If it's a blowout, whatever. Well, top of the ninth inning, I kind of glanced and his seats were not next to me the next night. I, I, Mariah and Nathan in Nathan's room. Maybe he was sitting with Gabe the next section over. We, had, we weren't able to get our seats together. And so I kept glancing and I looked and I was looking at Mariah and I said, you know what, top of the night, we're gonna wait for one more out, for one out. As soon as we get to one out, we're gonna start walking that way. And I looked and he was already getting up out of his seat because the Braves were beating him so bad, it was great. That's not the point of the story. I just wanna make sure I publicly declare that, <laughs> how bad the Braves beat the Cubs. Listen, when I went in the game, they were still, they're not any longer, uh, there was a couple weeks things, but, but they were still still asking everybody to wear a mask, unless you were actively eating or drinking. So Dave and I both bought a big bag of peanuts and we were actively eating and drinking through the entire game. I mean, I think I ate a peanut for each bag, you know. But here's, here's some perspective. If that peanut I was eating, and I do that at all ball games, it wasn't just a few more minutes. Uh, if that peanut was the nucleus, okay, the average atom between nucleus and an outer shell, 100 times, 100,000 times difference. If the peanut was the nucleus, that stadium would have been the outer shell. It gives you some perspective of how tiny atoms are and how much they have. And everything in between is empty space. Now here's the second part of that. There are some subatomic particles that, are, that work with atoms in, in, in matter. And there's two of them mainly that are important. One is a quark, a quark, Q-U-A-R-K-S, quarks. These particles are, are kinetic in nature and they are held together by gluons, G-L-U-O-N, gluons. So you've got gluons that are holding things together and you've got quarks that are the kinetic energy and you've got this space. There's an evolving theory in quantum mechanics that, that says that almost all mass in our bodies comes from the kinetic energies of the quarks. This, this sounds like an episode of Star Trek, it's really not. Um, the kinetic energy of the quarks and the binding energy of the gluons. Now, how are we made? What does the Bible say we're made? And, and whose image? God's image, right? That's how we know that Trinity was all present there because he says, let us make man in, in, in our image. So there's a reason for why we're made. So let's look at the scriptures for a second. And I don't think this is going to be a stretch. 
Firstly, in Ephesians 1.23, Paul says this, and the church is his body. He's comparing the church to a body. It is made fully complete by Christ, who fills all things everywhere with himself. Now, can I tell you, if you were 99.99% space, that's a lot for God to fill. And the Bible says that is filled. We were made to be filled with Christ. Here's another thing Paul wrote to the church in Colossians. Well, in Colossians, in the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verse 15. We, we sang it already this morning. And we sang it on purpose because I told Zoe, you need to sing that song. We sang Colossians 1, 15. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. I'm hearing the song in my head now. He is the image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on the earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. Listen to verse 17. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. In the metaphorical body that we're made in the image of, God is the glue on that holds it all together. So he's filling your space. He's holding you together. And then in Acts 17, 28, the first part of that verse, it says, for in him we live and move and have our being. That word move is the Greek word kineo, which is where we get the word kinetic, as in kinetic energy, set in motion, moving constantly, the opposite of indifference, to be stirred up. Listen, just physically, according to one estimate, about 37 sextillion chemical reactions are happening in your body right now. Even more if you ate sausage for breakfast. You're digesting food, you're processing sound, you're regenerating cells, you're purifying toxins, you're catalyzing enzymes, you're producing hormones, you're converting stored energy from body fat into blood sugar. All of that's going on, and that's just the surface. That, that's not even the depths of what your body is doing right now. That's what's going on in you. Can I tell you, here's what's happening. God made you, first of all, to be filled. He holds you together, and the Holy Spirit has put you into motion. That's where we get our spiritual mass. Just like we physically get our mass from gluons, quarks, and atoms, God is doing that in you spiritually. And it's, it's right here in Scripture. Here's another part of that, if you don't believe this, because right after the Holy Spirit hovers over the darkness, he shows up in verse 2 of Genesis, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. This is how God set things in motion. He created you to be filled. And I believe Adam and Eve didn't have 99.99% empty space. They were filled with the Spirit of God. Here's the sad part, though. At some point, the Spirit of God spiritually left them. And I think every person since has been born empty. Not the way God intended. And here's the reality. Quantum mechanics would say this, that if all the emptiness was extracted from your body, you would be nothing but a speck of dust. We don't need quantum mechanics, as Job told us in Job 34, 14. If God were to take back his spirit and withdraw his breath, all life would cease and humanity would turn again to dust. Who knew that Job followed science? That's awesome. It reminds me of how things were created to be one thing, and then they became another. The, I, I, I had this picture when I was reading this of, of, of a balloon that's used in crafts, sometimes used in arts and crafts, sometimes used in cooking. In arts and crafts, you might, you might cover the balloon in paper mache, blow it up, and then cover it in some kind of substance that hardens. Or, or in, I've seen in uh, cooking, some of the cooking shows I like to deal with like sweet stuff, you can take a balloon and you see Zoe's mouth and she knows where I'm going, chocolate. You dip that balloon in chocolate and then you wait for it to harden and you pop the balloon and you got something. See, God created us. He breathed Adam. He breathed his breath and blew that balloon up and Adam filled him up. 
But because of Adam's sin, the balloon is gone. And now, ever since then, we're just born an empty shell. But we're not made to be an empty shell. God made us to be filled. And to fill us with something that in him we move and have our being, that kinetic energy. And he holds it all together. Can you see this picture of God the Father wanting to fill you? Wanting to fill the empty space in your life? And Jesus Christ, Paul says, is holding everything together. The Holy Spirit is that energy that's there. That's the, that's the power the powder cake God wants you to be. The Holy Spirit provides friction. He provides filling. Thirdly, he provides function. He provides function. He, the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to do more with him than we could ever do without him. Now, we refer to this in, in, in sort of in religious circles and terms as anointing. That's the, that's the but anointing doesn't start with F, so it didn't work. But the reason we are anointed is to be able to function. That's the purpose of anointing. We make the mistakes of things that anointing is only for preachers. It's only for people that stand in front of people on a professional level and speak God's word. And, and that's a misconception. Anointing is for preaching. It's for that. But it's for any function. Okay, let, me, let me prove it to you. Exodus 31. God is giving instructions about how to build his tabernacle. Build the place that he's going to reside in. He says this. And, and verse 1 of 31, Then the Lord said to Moses, Look, I have specifically chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, grandson of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. Verse 3, I have filled him with the Spirit of God, giving him great wisdom, ability, and expertise in all kinds of crafts. He is a master craftsman, expert in working with gold, silver, and bronze. He is skilled in engraving and mounting gemstones and carving wood. He is a master at every craft. God says, how would you like to have a project and God speaks to you and says, I've got your head contract. This is who, and here's how he's going to get the job done. I'm going to fill him with the Holy Spirit. That's the first thing he says. Now, God gave him talents and abilities. And he, he had these skills. But God finds it important not to point that out first. He says, here's why I'm choosing him. I'm going to fill him with the very Spirit of God. And that anointing is going to allow his natural abilities, the things that he has to work way better than what he already has. He's manifesting his spirit through this creative giving. His spirit is giving uh, Bezalel something beyond his ability, revealing beyond his knowledge. See, the anointing enables us to do, what better, to do better than we're able to do it by ourselves. That's who the Holy Spirit is. That's what he does. We look throughout the Old Testament, and, and anointing was something that was that was a physical thing that, that God put in place. Where I mentioned earlier, we we're praying for people, and God, God actually started the concept of anointing was when He anointed, and, and He did it with oil. That's why we still use oil today. And, um, and, and He anointed the priest, the original priest. He, he literally poured it over his head. The Bible says it dripped down his beard and all over his linen and clothing. I bet his wife was having a fit. Um, like, what are you doing? And, uh, and 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 uh, it's it, it it dripped on it. Now I, you know, it's funny. I didn't plan this today. This is actually linen. Uh, I, I did plan this today because I get hot in here and I want to wear something that's really light and breathes. I did not wear it as a priestly garment. Um, and and I'm quite certain because it came from H and M, so it is not anointed. Um, I just uh, I'll tell you that right there. Uh, it was actually on sale uh, when I went with the girls. Anyway. Um, and Mary said it looked good, so if it doesn't, it's all a plain girl. I, I, I almost spilled oil on my linen this morning. That's how it was done. It was poured over the priest, and the Bible says it literally dripped off the hem of his linen robe. Like it covered him. We see that physically done in several different ways, but then we see the Holy Spirit move throughout the Old Testament with this idea. The Holy Spirit is what anointed, who anointed Joshua to lead Israel. Uh, we, Elizabeth talked about that last week. Joshua was not a natural born, you know, military leader. The Holy Spirit's who anointed him to do that. The Holy Spirit anointed Deborah to be a wise judge when it was needed. That wasn't her natural gifting, but God spoke and the Holy Spirit anointed her. The Holy Spirit is who gave Samson his strength. It was the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gave Gideon 
a, a confidence that he did not have to be able to, to go and do what God called him to do. And as we move from the judges to the kings, the Holy Spirit anointed Saul. The Holy Spirit anointed Saul to actually prophesy. He turned Saul into a prophet. The Holy Spirit is the one that downloaded the blueprints for the temple into David's creative, imaginative mind. And then he gave Gideon, uh, gave Daniel the ability to interpret dreams when he was in exile. And then when they come back from exile, the Holy Spirit's the one that gave Zerubbabel, it stirred his spirit to be able to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem with a hammer in one hand and a sword in the other. That, that's, we see him in the Old Testament. Can I tell you, none of those people I mentioned, or any others, there are many others that were annoyed by the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, none of them were perfect. And we see this picture of the Holy Spirit bringing about anointing. It's always temporary, though. It was always something where the Holy Spirit had to come upon them because they did not have a heart that was right with God. They couldn't. Jesus had not died on the cross. They, there's no way they had been forgiven of their sins. And the Holy Spirit cannot inhabit and dwell in an unclean vessel. This is not something he can do. We'll get to that in our, why that's important in a minute. We get to the New Testament and we see the Holy Spirit, the anointing that was on Mary to the point that she conceived a child without a man. So some of you right now are going, oh, let it be done. Maybe not. Maybe you like that. The Holy Spirit conceives Jesus with Mary. We see him, I mentioned earlier, he takes on the form of a dove and actually descends over Jesus as he's being baptized. In that, in that one scene, we have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all together. The Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus as he's baptized. The voice of the Father, audibly, out loud, says, Behold, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. He gives him that sort of bar mitzvah-ish blessing over someone who was somewhat illegitimate because he didn't have a earthly dad. There was a powerful moment. The Holy Spirit then leads, the anointing of the Holy Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness where he's tempted, but where he is with him. And then at one point, Jesus sort of ties together sort of the anointing and the oil of the Old Testament. He ties it together with what he's doing spiritually as he quotes Isaiah 61 in Luke 4, 18, he says, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. And in this statement where Jesus is quoting Isaiah, he sort of ties together all of what God had done in the Old Testament temporarily and he pulls it together and he says, this is the Holy Spirit's job to bring about anointing, to anoint you for purpose. Only now, because we can't ask forgiveness of Jesus who died for us on a cross, who paid for everything with his stripes, we were healed. We've been talking about that all morning. When he did that on the cross, it enables us now to be clean, not because of anything we are, but because of what he did on the cross. But now that we can be clean, the Holy Spirit, Jesus told his disciples in John in that conversation between verses 13 and 17, chapters 13 and 17, he says to his disciples at one point, it is better that I go. Why? Because they didn't need a temporary anointing that might come upon them hanging out with Jesus. He says, I am going to give you the Holy Spirit. He will come and live in you and dwell in you. And he will come. He makes that promise. And the Holy Spirit is there for every reason you can think of to bring about function. He's there to bring about healing. He's there to bring about purpose. He's there to bring about everything you need. Jesus even says, uh, as he, right before he leaves in Acts 1.8, you shall receive power. To what? To better show your neighbors how spiritual you are? No. To show everybody at church how much more spiritually superior you are. That, that's what we've turned it into. I'm just kind of going with the narratives. No, he says, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. 
I can tell you that as you look around the room at the unreached people groups that are still on the wall, Victor said, can we leave them up? I said, yeah, after Thursday night, leave them up. Because I want us to see them. I encourage every one of you before you leave today, just stop by each one. Because that's why the Holy Spirit has filled you. To give you the function to be able to look and pray for people, not just in Jerusalem or in Western Judea or Alabama County or in you know, the greater Blue Ridge District. But to the uttermost parts of the world. That's why you're in power. Now, I mentioned this at the beginning, and I want to close with this. There's, there's a sort of misconception in, 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 within the church world. And I think it's come about because we, we want to work together. And so there's a level of orthodoxy that, listen, anybody that, that, that believes in Jesus, died, rose again, I mean, that follows him and believes he's your personal Lord, I, 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 the rest of their doctrine I might disagree with, but I, I can kind of join hands with anybody that sort of has that fundamental tenet and belief. And we can pray to God the Father in the name of Jesus. I can tolerate almost anything. And that's a good thing. Um, but I think sometimes we've, we've gotten to the place where we've broken down because we want to be, and I think we should be, kingdom-minded, to be on some level ecumenical within that evangelical kind of reach. I think that's important to do. We can't win everybody in this county or even in the city without everybody else. So every day when I, when I leave my house, Every church that I come at, I'm praying this morning. I'm praying for God to anoint David Collier to speak his word at Rose Baptist, for people to come to a saving knowledge of Christ. I'm praying for, for Jimmy Temple over at Hillsborough Baptist. When I pass them, that he would preach under the power of the Holy Spirit that he is filled with, that he will lead people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, that the, that the captives would be set free, that people will be delivered. I pray for, for Todd Johnson, uh, over at, 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 at Hope uh, Presbyterian in Crozet. I don't even, I think they're still online or they might be meeting somewhere outside, uh, wherever they are. And I, I don't have to really pray for Todd because it's all predestined. He's got the God's already. But I do, I pray for him that, that someone will hear and acknowledge that, that God will speak. As well as anywhere else I come by, I, I, I want to be kingdom minded. But I'm afraid sometimes we've kind of sort of. We, because we want to be tolerant of everybody and what they believe in that kind of thing, we've got to the point where the Holy Spirit has become sort of this sort of option. Sort of option you can check. And can I tell you when it comes to options, nine times out of ten, I skip over them. Especially if it's going to cost me more. Especially if it's going to mean more out of me, more somewhat ever. I just finished trying to plan this trip to speak for Ella's funeral next week, and it's sort of last minute, and I'm trying to put all the pieces together. And I'm not, I'm tired, I'm not thinking straight. It's been a rough week. I, I booked and had to cancel two different airline tickets, a hotel room, because I, I put the wrong date in. I was all excited at the price I was getting. This is amazing. I'm booking a flight for three days from now. I can't believe I'm getting this rate. And I wouldn't get that rate, because I was booking it for June. I mean, I was making mistakes left and right. I was trying to figure out things and, 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 and what was throwing me, I was so focused on all the options, mostly skipping over them, you know? Especially now when you rent a car. It's like, I got a really good rate. Here's some options. Well, if I had checked every option, I don't want to look at a rate anymore. I was like, nope, 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 nope. Don't need that, don't need that. And a lot of stuff so I didn't need. I didn't need child safety seats. I mean, that was easy, you know? I didn't even need navigation because I got a thousand dollar piece of equipment in my hand that, you know, well, it wasn't quite that, but you know what I'm saying. I got this supercomputer in my, in my hand that I carry with me all the time that can tell me anywhere I need to go. And, and, and actually is even probably better than a bunch of GPSs that are in the car. But there's all these options. And I'm afraid that we've turned the Holy Spirit into one of those options. Well, that's okay for Victor or some of those weirdo people, you know, like Tanya or Andy that just want to be. You know, Pat's old school and Michelle and everything. They, they didn't know any better back in their day, so that's okay for them. But I, I'm just not that weird. I, I'm just kind of not going to check that option. This is why it's important that we refer to the Holy Spirit as breath. He 
is so necessary in our lives. This is a scripture you've heard me quote a bunch of different times. Paul says this in Ephesians 5.18. Don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's always baffled me. Why does Paul take that instruction in that moment and try to bring it with the Holy Spirit? And, and you've heard me talk before about how, you know, uh, Maggie, when she was tiny and little, somehow knew that this guy in a hotel, we were trying to get to our room, and he was trying to get in a room, and he was not being very effective, even though he had a key. I'm not sure it was the key to that room. And he somehow was so inebriated that he couldn't get the key in the slot, so he's just pounding on the door. And, my, and, and Maggie, I think at that time, maybe four at the most, and she walked by and we got in the room, she said, Daddy, why was that drunk man in the hall? And I'm like, why does my four-year-old know what drunk looks like? And I've said this before, Paul's kind of saying, you should be so filled with the Holy Spirit that it's that obvious. That it's that obvious. But I heard something else this week that I think was interesting. The Latin word for alcohol is spiritus. That's why we call those kind of spirits. That's where that comes from. And I heard somebody say this this week, I thought it was really kind of powerful. Is it possible? That Paul brought that out because he was trying to let us know, don't try to replace one spirit with another. Yeah. And can I tell you, I'm not going to just pick on alcohol, but any substance. You say, well, I don't drink. Well, that's okay. But I need these pills. And please hear me out. I'm not talking about medicine. I'm not talking about stuff that's legitimate. But we know the difference. God used that. Matter of fact, Paul at one point told Timothy, it's okay to use a little wine, meaning mix it in with your water, to purify it to help your stomach. He was having stomach issues. Paul was in that moment saying, medicinal is okay. God created things to help you with medicine. But you know the difference between, you know, that. Uh, NyQuil is medicine. It's medicinal. If you drink three bottles every night, you probably have a problem. <laughs> and can you tell what your problem is? Your problem is you're trying to replace the Holy Spirit and what he does and the function of his anointing in your life with something else. Anything you use, any substance, anything. I don't want to just talk about physical substance, alcohol, drugs, those things. If, if, if you have to, oh, I don't want to say this out loud because this is going to sound really unspiritual in this current climate. If you need three drops of oil on your temple just to be able to sleep every night, You know what? Oh, I knew that was going to be bad. I can feel the heat, the pushback right there. I'm going to stare at the floor right here. I don't even want to look at you at home. Because those are like right in Acts chapter, you know, 32. Essential oil is supposed to be used. That's what James was talking about. He said anoint. That's not what he was talking about. Listen, listen. Again, it's okay to use things to help you. God created. That's fine. Just ask yourself, am I replacing the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the filling, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, the friction, that, am I taking away his ability to stir my conscience? Is that replacing something? That's how important the Holy Spirit is. He's not to be replaced. That's why Paul really makes that statement. That's why he makes that comparison. He says, listen, I know you want boldness. I know you want to be uninhibited. I know you want to do that. Make sure you're doing it the right way. Make sure you're doing it the way that God says is okay and not in a way that can harm you, that can ruin your life. I wasn't intending to close on a prohibitionist message. It's not really the point. The point is we need the Holy Spirit. He's got to be the breath I love that song we've been, I've been singing it for decades. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. What was that saying? This the very breath that we breathe. I, I just went way old school, uh, you know. I'll bring it forward a couple decades. Um, you know, you're the breath in my lungs. So I pour out my praise. Saying the same thing. God, 
and you've given me breath in my lungs. You've given me air in my lungs. You have brought about something in me that is greater than I can do. Can I tell you? Take advantage of the space you have in your life today. Let God fill it. Let it be filled with Him. Because here's the reality. The Holy Spirit can't fill someone when they're full of Himself. And that's what most of us do with all that empty space we feel. We fill it with ourselves, with our desires, with our dreams, with all the things that we try. And nothing you try to fill your life will fulfill you. But the Holy Spirit will. It will not fulfill you. You can try. If I ask God to let me try a couple times, you know, God, they say money doesn't make you happy. Let me try that. Let me, uh, let me prove that. God, experiment on me. <laughs> I have a friend, I say a friend, he's much older, he's old enough to be my dad. And then some. And he's very wealthy. And I, there's been times I've looked and thought, you know, God, God I'd like to try that. I can do these services. Can I tell you why he's very wealthy? I've seen him give away vehicles without even blinking because God told him to pull over and get the guy on the side of the road his car. I watched him in an offering put the deed to a $375,000 house in the offering. And he, he spoke at the end of that service. He said, some of you think this is amazing. He said, I've been trying to sell this thing for a year now. He said, can I tell you, I'm going to sleep tonight. I don't have to worry anymore if it's going to sell. And I thought, what? Because to him, oh, I'm, trying, I'm not, okay, I'm going to not let my filter work right here, and we'll say this out, I'll probably regret this later. To him, more money was more problems. It, it was very much that way. And we all look at it like, wow, he's got that. He's built a new house. He's trying to sell this house. Wow, wouldn't I like to have one house on the market? And, and, and this was a long time ago. Nowadays, he'd have four offers, three times the, the what he was asking. But he, he was literally relieved that he was able to. God blessed him and used him as a conduit to bless others. And I've tried to tell God, I will bless everybody. I promise. And God generally says, well, who are you blessing now? If you can't bless me with what you have now, you probably aren't going to bless others with more. Because he who is faithful in little can be faithful in much. So God's really been working on me, on being faithful with what I have. And not waiting on the big check. You live like that, right? If that dude shows up with that van and the flowers and the balloons and that big giant check at my house tomorrow... Lord, I'll give almost half of it to missions. And after I pay off the kids' school loans and get Andy new man, and I got a list first, but after that, man, there's just no telling what I can do. And God says, well, start doing it. Start doing it. There's so much need in the world right now. Start doing it. This has turned in from don't drink and do drugs to be generous. All those are godly principles. And here's why that's important. Because you, when you get rid of self and you don't lean on the things that you rely on, because that's all substances are. It's things I can control. It's things I can pour. It's things I can swallow. It's things I can smoke. It's things, it's whatever it is, it's things that allow me to take care of that emptiness and try to fill it with something. Whether it's money, substance, it doesn't matter. And God is saying today, you know, you need the Holy Spirit. If you, I created you to be filled with the breath of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to hold that thing together for you. And as you live and move and have your being in me, we're going to do incredible things that you can't even begin to do on your own. That's what he wants for you. That's what he has for you. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to do. It wants to be that friction in your life that, that, that calls you to see the darkness so that God can speak life and create.
created in your life. He is, wants to fill you so that you're not empty because he made you to be filled. And he wants to give you function through his anointing so that you can function in the way that God's created you to function and not live listlessly with no purpose. That's what God wants for you. But it, it comes down to this. You've got to surrender. You've got to get rid of yourself. You've got to crucify yourself. You've got to acknowledge that without him, you're nothing. Without him, you're a sinner. Without him, you need him in your life. And once you allow him to do that work in your life, and, and some of you, maybe here, maybe at home, or some of us, are already feeling that friction part. You're already feeling that, I need to make a change. I know I need to change something. That's what he's calling us, why you feel that. That's why you feel it. I have seen people hit that friction and boom, react to it. I've seen, I've seen people they felt the Holy Spirit move for you, Jeff. I'm looking for it right here behind you. I've seen people, as little children, presented the gospel. That the minute they finished, I've watched people run out of here. There was so much friction. And I'm not exaggerating, Emma. They run. Because there was that friction. Can I tell you, lean into the friction today. Don't push back. Allow it to reveal the darkness. Allow him to speak light into your darkness today so that he can fill you, so that he can anoint you with function and purpose. Will you bow your heads to me? Father, we thank you so much for leaving us the Holy Spirit. God, I ask you today, just to, as, as some are feeling and calling and drawing to you to make a change in their life, God, let them make that change today. Let them acknowledge that you came, you died, you rose again, that you sit at the Father's right hand, praying and interceding for them, and that when you left Jesus, you left us the Holy Spirit. That that feeling they're feeling is not just their conscience, it's actually the Holy Spirit kind of hovering, just like he did in creation, over the darkness and chaos of their life. And he wants to help them. He wants to create an atmosphere where they can come to you, Father, as their source, and acknowledge what Jesus did on the cross, so that you can speak, let there be light into their life. Lord, help all of us have that constant filling. When, you, when, when Paul wrote uh, to not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, that, that word he used in the Greek was that, that progressive tense that doesn't mean like an experience. It means constantly, every day. So those of us who, who have a clean heart because of your righteousness, because we follow you, God, help us to seek and ask for that filling every day. To not just have an experience with you, but to be filled, to be full, to be constantly filled with your Holy Spirit. That we may be anointed for greater things. So that we may function in you. So that we might lead others to allow you to hover in their life. To lead them to know what that friction is so they can be filled. So they can be anointed. So they'll lead others. God, we long to see your glory fill the earth. And your glory is the... The, what doing what you've called us to do. When we do that, we bring you glory. Lord, I pray that you will allow us to lead others, to lead others, to lead others, to lead others until the world is full of your glory. We give you praise, Father, for what you're doing in us and through us. Thank you, Father, for what you're doing right now as some are opening up their heart to you. I pray that you'll give them courage to speak those words to say, God, I'm a sinner. Please fill my life. I want to follow you. I want to, I want to change directions. I want to repent. I want to go in your direction and follow after you. I know you came, you died, you rose again. Forgive me, Lord. Be the Lord, the supreme authority of my life. Lord, I thank you, God, for those that are making that confession today. For those that are asking you to fill, hear their hearts today. Fill them with your spirit today. We thank you, Father. We want to now give you an opportunity to respond to this message you've heard on breath, the Spirit of God. Your memory verse this week is on the back of the connection card, of course, is uh, some things you can do to respond. There's a memory verse. There's some action steps you can take. We encourage you, if you would, to fill out your connection card and to 
and leave it with us as we leave in the basket of the lobby there. Your memory verse is that verse in Ephesians 5, 18 that says, be not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. A number of years ago, I did a, a study of that word filled there. It's a very interesting word. When we think of filled, I think oftentimes we think of the image of filling a vessel. And it, it does mean that. But this word also, in classical Greek, was the word that was used uh, for making pickles. Because you take a cucumber, as we are accustomed to make pickles, and you put it in a brine, and you leave it, and that brine fills the cucumber. It permeates, it enters into it, and it fills up every part of it. So it's not just uh, for some aspects of the it. Speak with a voice of thunder. It's not just for some aspects of your life, but it's every part of your life. That's all the things that our pastor was talking about. He's talking about, you know, what things we use and don't use in our giving and, and our witnessing. And every aspect of life is covered by being filled with the Spirit because He wants to permeate the very essence. He wants to fill the very atoms of your makeup. So that every part of you is completely filled and controlled and under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And as the pastor said, that's not optional, that's something absolutely necessary. And with that in mind, let's prepare our hearts now to receive communion. Remember that this all was possible because of what Jesus did for us. He who was filled with the Spirit himself. He did not do his ministry. That's how important and necessary the Holy Spirit's infilling is. Jesus did not begin his own ministry until he was filled with the Spirit. And then he faithfully obeyed and served the Lord until it was time to go to the cross for us. And we remember that. As we often do, and often think about uh, this, uh, the communion service is an encounter with the Lord. It is a memorial that he shed his blood and he gave his body on the cross for our sins. And it's an opportunity to not only remember though, but to also come into his presence and to experience him, to encounter him in a fresh and a new way. So, in accordance with the word of God, we remember, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, that on the night when Jesus betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup and he gave thanks for it. He blessed it. He said, this is the cup the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Do this to remember to me. Father, how great was the Father's love for us. Your love. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Father, we stand amazed at your great love. We stand in awe of the sacrifice of Christ. And we remember, Lord, and we give thanks this day. We who are so undeserving, unworthy, yet in grace and mercy you reach down to us. And so today we remember and we give thanks in Jesus' name. Before we close today, let me remind you we are in the midst of our prayer initiative. Uh, there are a few prayer guides there in the back. If you haven't got one yet, you can still join us. And if we run out, let me know and I can uh, get you one or you can go to Advancing the Admissions website, advancingtheadmissions.com slash pray and download them from there. There are also on the back table some of these little wristbands that simply say pray for the unreached. And 
is just a way to remind you to pray for the unreached peoples of the earth. Uh, as we have shared last week, I firmly believe this is probably the main reason, if not the only reason, Jesus Christ has not yet returned. Because this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. And then Today in our prayer initiative, the region we focus on is Europe and Russia. So as I close in prayer, we will pray for Europe and Russia and then close with our benediction. Father, today we do want to pray for this region of the world, Europe and Russia. God's a region of the world that Christianity entered into in the first century. And for many centuries, Father, the faith flourished in this region, God. God, this became the bastion of, of Christendom. And for most of the past 2,000 years, Europe was considered a Christian region of the world. But Father, in the past 100 years, there's been such a deterioration spiritually, Father. Well, secularism is everywhere. Atheism is on the rise. People go to church, but Father, it's a cultural thing. It's, a, it's part of their ethnic identity. It's part of the family tradition. But Father, there are so few born-again believers, God, small percentages in most European countries today, God. We pray for your spirit to move in Europe. Restore what was once there. Revive, resurrect, Father, the faith that was once there, Father. Move once again in this area of the world. Father, we pray you would raise up missionaries and evangelists and pastors and church planners who would go and into the various regions of Europe and Russia, Father, and the God will proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and the very rich harvest of souls. We especially pray today, Father, for the unreached people. And there are dozens and hundreds of them, Father, of people, groups that have never been reached effectively with the gospel of Jesus Christ. May they become reached, engaged, and evangelized. We pray in Jesus' name. And Father, we also, as we, we pray, we remember this message of the Holy Spirit. That God, we're not only concerned about the uttermost parts of the earth, and we are, but we're concerned about Jerusalem and Judea. So let us in our own neighborhoods, here in the crusade, our own community, Father, be light in this world. And to help us to do this, we pray our benediction together, Father. Psalm 1914. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer.